Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special presentation, Humanity at a Crossroads, Key Messages from the Global Biodiversity Outlook. It is my pleasure to introduce David Cooper, the Deputy Executive Secretary of the United Nations Environment Program, Convention on Biological Diversity. David will be pre presenting the Global Biodiversity Outlook 5, which launched this past September. This is the flagship publication of the CBD and provides global summary of progress towards the Aishi biodiversity targets and sets the scene for the development of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And now I invite David to share his screen and take it away. Thank you very much, Melissa. And um, my thanks to C4 ICRAF and to the, the whole team at the Global Landscapes Forum for organizing this uh, conference over these two days. Um, the CBD and the CBD Secretariat are very pleased to collaborate with the GLF on this event. Indeed, it's happening when we should be in Kunming um, for the final two days of COP15, where, of course, we're due to um, approve and adopt the, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Um, that Melissa just, just mentioned. Um, it also follows the recent UN summit on biodiversity. So I think a very timely event. Of course, the reason we are not in Kunming um, is because of the ongoing um, pandemic that has um, made it impossible for us to have COP at the time intended. Uh, and this really, draws attention, I think, to the theme of this, of this whole Global Landscapes for Forum, One World, One Health, and the interlinkages between the natural world uh, and, and, and our health. And indeed, it, it reinforces the, um, the focus of this, this event, Humanity at a Crossroads, and the which I, I'm, as Melissa um, indicated, I, um, is the, 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 the theme behind the, the Global Biodiversity Outlook, which um, was launched in, in September, and which, as Melissa mentioned, provides an update on the status of uh, achievement of the, of the current strategic plan, the current Aichi Biodiversity Targets, and sets the scene for the, um, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. While we wait for the presentation to be pulled up, um, we heard a very inspiring message from Miss Elizabeth Mrema in our opening plenary. And we're just so grateful for UNCBD uh, being, uh, you know, being a part of this uh, biodiversity conference with us. And we're just very much looking forward to hearing more about the Global Biodiversity Outlook 5, some of the key findings, and perhaps getting some inspiration and some hope for what could be done in the future. So this uh, session is actually being um, translated into French, Spanish, and Portuguese. And so you can find, if you scroll down to the bottom of the uh, session description, you can find a link for Interactio, and you can uh, just click on your language, um, find the launch pad, the Global Biodiversity Outlook, and listen in your own language. Thank you, Melissa, for filling in. Um, the, the Global Biodiversity Outlook, which was launched um, last month, it contains three main sections, and I'm going to briefly go through um, the first two, and then spend a little more time on the on the on the final section, which is looking forward uh, to the to the future. Um, the first section really just uh, um, explores the links between biodiversity and sustainable development more generally. The second section um, provides that update on progress towards the Aichi biodiversity targets, uh, the end of the ten-year period, um, uh, which was established um, in Nagoya, uh, Japan at COP10. And then finally, the final section really provides the basis for the uh, development of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. 
The report draws upon a wide range of uh, inputs, including the national reports from, from countries and the national biodiversity strategies and action plans, um, but also uh, a large academic literature as well as the latest information on indicators. And of course, a major contribution to the report was the IPBES Global Assessment on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services launched last year. So focusing first on this first section on the linkages between biodiversity and sustainable development, the report analyzes the linkages between the various sustainable development goals and the targets of those goals and the Aichi biodiversity targets and looks at how biodiversity contributes to each of the sustainable development goals. Building on the reports from um, from IPBES, the analysis of IPBES, it, it shows that the ongoing declines in biodiversity actually jeopardizes achievement of many of the sustainable development goals. The report also looks at how the sustainable development goals contribute to the uh, achievement of our biodiversity objectives. Many of these uh, sustainable development goals will address the various drivers of, um, bi of uh, biodiversity loss. Uh, there's also the possibility of um, some limitations in the way that we uh, develop um, the, the, the policies that are needed to achieve the sustainable development goals and protecting biodiversity. And so, um, for example, if we look at the uh, mechanisms to reduce climate change, um, there are possibilities for synergies through nature-based solutions, but also um, possible trade-offs. I'll turn now to the uh, second part of the report, which looks at the progress towards the Aichi biodiversity targets. In the report, we go target by target and analyze progress based on national reports, based on indicators, based on the scientific literature. In this uh, screen, we just show a snapshot of progress um, to each of those 20 biodiversity targets. Um, what we're showing here in green is those elements of the targets that have been achieved in red where uh, no progress has been made and in yellow where some progress has been made but not sufficient to achieve the targets. And you'll see that in fact none of the 20 targets that governments set uh, 10 years ago have been fully achieved. Um, by the this year, the target date. There has been progress towards some elements of some of those targets as illustrated here in the green segments. So for example, with target 11, which is about protected areas, we do see that we're likely to achieve the 17% target for protection of terrestrial areas, as well as the 10% target for the achievement of marine areas. Um, we also have progress to many other elements of, the, uh, of this target, but not uh, sufficient to achieve them, them all. Um, we also see some progress in the area of invasive alien species, which is uh, addressed through target nine uh, in the uh, development of access and benefit sharing legislation under the Nagoya Protocol, uh, dealing with target 16, with national biodiversity strategies and action plans, target 17, with international um, finance, target 20, and with um, progress in scientific uh, information on biodiversity. On the other hand, we see very poor um, progress in terms of some targets that are indicated in red here. For example, target three, uh, which is concerned with incentives with, and subsidies, we see very little progress in removing perverse um, subsidies. And in fact, we're still spending um, some 500 uh, billion uh, a year on perverse subsidies, subsidies, subsidies that are potentially 
harmful to biodiversity. These are in areas of fossil fuels, uh, in agriculture, in fisheries. But we also have here, you will see a lot of yellow. That is a, a lot of targets where we have some progress, but not sufficient to achieve the targets. And I want to just explore a little bit um, behind some of that yellow. Um, uh, if we look at target five, which was to at least half the rate of deforestation um, and, and reduce the loss and degradation of other ecosystems, there has been progress. Globally, the rate of deforestation has fallen by about a third complete to the, compared to the previous decade. Clearly not enough to, move, to achieve the target, but progress uh, nonetheless. In the area of fisheries, which is addressed through target six, we see that in those areas where good management policies have been introduced, where we have stock assessments, catch limits and enforcement, then we have seen recovery of marine fish stocks. And these amount to about half of fisheries globally. Uh, with target 12, although we do see continued uh, extinctions and continued increase in the risk of extinction, such as the best uh, assessment reported about a million species, will be at risk of extinction if we do not take um, additional actions. Nonetheless, conservation actions that have been taken over the uh, past decade and indeed throughout the life of the convention have reduced the number of extinctions that would have happened. And this is through actions such as um, introduction of protected areas, hunting restrictions, control of invasive species and the like. The message here, therefore, one of the really important messages from GBO5 is where countries have put in place measures, then we do see results. Policies do work, measures do work. And that's one of the key um, messages from the current strategic plan. But nonetheless, we need much greater efforts to reduce the underlying drivers of biodiversity loss. Um, we, there's a number of other lessons that come from the report that are, that are mentioned here um, and which we believe will be very useful uh, for governments and other stakeholders to take into account as we develop the post-2020 uh, global biodiversity framework. I'll now turn to the, the third main section of the global biodiversity outlook which is looking at pathways to the 2050 vision for biodiversity. This was a vision for biodiversity that was also agreed in Nagoya as part of the um, strategic plan for biodiversity for the current decade. If we look at what various models and scenarios tell us, we know that business as usual will lead to continuing loss of biodiversity. We, under these business as usual scenarios, we could continue to, to lose hundreds of millions of hectares of natural ecosystems over the coming decades. We would see perhaps a three degree rise um, on current policies of, uh, at, of global average temperatures. We would see still massive increases in the risk of invasive alien species. We'd see increased um, pollution, including um, between a doubling and a trebling of the rate of um, addition of plastic pollution into our oceans. So clearly business as usual will mean continued biodiversity loss. And as we have established already, this will jeopardize achievement of the sustainable development goals. But these scenarios and models 
also show us that it is possible to reduce the rate of biodiversity loss. It is possible to bend the curve and put biodiversity on a path to, towards recovery and towards the 2050 vision. But to do so, this will require a whole suite of actions. It will require transformative change. Those suite of actions are indicated here. Essential among these will be increased investment in conservation and indeed in restoration. Um, and in fact, we therefore very much welcome this United Nations decade for ecosystem restoration. But these conservation and restoration actions on their own will not be enough. They will need to be accompanied by measures to address the other drivers of biodiversity loss. If we don't, for example, address climate change, then there will be no chance of bending the curve of biodiversity loss, even if we reduce land use change. We will also need to take actions to address uh, the other drivers I mentioned just now, invasive alien species, uh, pollution, uh, and over-exploitation of uh, fisheries and of uh, wildlife. But beyond these, in order even to make it viable that we can invest in conservation and restoration, to have the space available in the landscape if you like, for conservation and restoration, we also need to invest in sustainable intensification of agriculture, sustainable increases in production, um, particularly of agriculture. And we will also need to reduce excessive consumption and, and waste. And it is only through a whole portfolio of actions along these lines that we can bend the curve. What we do in GBO5 is explore how this portfolio of actions would play out in a number of transitions that will take place in different sect across different sectors and in different parts of the landscape and, and seascape. Um, and in GBO5, we explore these eight areas of, of transition, uh, looking at land and forests, looking at freshwater, looking at fisheries and other aspects of how we manage the oceans, looking at sustainable agriculture, the food system, how we plan cities and infrastructure, how we take action to address climate change, mitigation and adaptation, and how we look at the interaction between nature and health. Through, through limits on time, I'll just focus now uh, on four of these, beginning with the land and forests transition. Of course, very relevant to the Global uh, Landscapes Forum. Land use change remains the main driver of, of, of biodiversity loss currently and will continue to be a very important uh, driver. We, without addressing land use change, we will not be able to uh, reverse the loss of, of biodiversity. And given that we have competing demands for the use of land, this means we need to adopt an integrated approach to land use uh, and land use change. We have uh, a lot of um, a substantial evidence base for the uh, investments we need in protected areas uh, and in other effective uh, uh, conservation measures and also in the um, need to restore and rehabilitate ecosystems. And one important point I, I would like to, to highlight here that comes very clearly from the literature and, 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 and clearly from a number of papers 
published in the last uh, couple of years, is the need for focusing on the areas that really matter. Um, so looking at areas of, of high biodiversity value, but also at the same time looking at how uh, by focusing on uh, focusing protected areas and ecosystem restoration activities on areas that will give, um, generate additional benefits for, for people through, in terms of nature's contributions to people or ecosystem services, including climate mitigation. So there will be a need to manage landscapes to balance conservation and restoration, the production of food and other needs, and the provision of all uh, ecosystem services. Spatial planning, therefore, um, will be an essential part of any post-2020 global biodiversity framework, looking at how we manage uh, the use of the landscape. Another key area will be um, looking at food systems. One of the uh, other transitions focuses on how we manage uh, farms, how we manage agricultural landscapes, but we'll also need to look at the demand side of the food systems. Promoting diets that are both healthy and sustainable. Um, and this will mean limiting excessive consumption of um, foods that put a very high footprint on the landscape. So um, in particular, the uh, consumption of meat where those levels of consumption are particularly high. And to do so will require obviously being able to produce nutritious food, but also um, enabling people to have access to diets that are both healthy uh, and sustainable. Actions by the private sector, actions by farmers, actions across the whole supply chain will be uh, essential if we're going to move towards this transition, as well, of course, the individual um, behavior of the, of the population at large. One other um, area will be how we manage the transition um, in addressing the, both the mitigation to, of climate change and adaptation to climate change. And we know there's a huge potential here for uh, employing nature-based solutions. We know that these alone will not be enough. We certainly need a rapid phase out of fossil fuel use, um, but nature-based solutions through on the one hand, uh, increased conservation, on the other hand, uh, restoration, and on the better management of agricultural areas to reduce emissions from, from agriculture, could contribute around a third of the total effort needed um, to reduce net greenhouse gas emissions. And these same measures will also help our landscapes be more resilient to the changes uh, that we will see even with close to 1.5 uh, degree, uh, a limit of, of close to 1.5 degrees. Finally, I would like to mention the, what we're calling the biodiversity inclusive One Health um, transition. The current pandemic has highlighted the increased risk of emergence of zoonotic diseases from the destruction of nature. We can therefore reduce the risk uh, of um, future pandemics by conserving and very carefully restoring uh, ecosystems. Also by promoting use of wildlife that is 
sustainable, legal, and safe. In doing this, we need to be aware of the multiple ways that people interact with nature and the multiple linkages between biodiversity and uh, all aspects of human health. The pandemic has also highlighted, for instance, the, the importance of access to green space for people's well-being, physical uh, and mental. What this really highlights um, is that increased attention to the way we manage our natural ecosystems is, is important not only for reducing the risk of, uh, of pandemics, not only for um, addressing climate change, and not only for reducing the risk of the sixth mass extinction. We have all of these, all of these elements are really um, part of a, a, a single, a single problem, a single, that, and can be addressed uh, together. And indeed in the report, we highlight the uh, interlinkages among these various uh, transitions. In order to proceed with these transitions, we really are talking about um, transformative change. Uh, and the report ends by highlighting the kinds of leverage points and levers for transformative change. These indeed were developed uh, um, through the IPBES uh, global assessment. They show that we would need to be looking beyond the management of biodiversity through environmental, by environmental sectors to exploring how we can um, mobilize change through addressing inequality, um, uh, looking at values and, and, and social norms. And we illustrate how these will apply to the various transition areas. So just uh, in, in summary, um, some of the key messages from the, from the Global Biodiversity Outlook. The assessment of progress towards the uh, Aichi biodiversity target shows, unfortunately, that none of the Aichi targets were, were fully met. We had many examples of success, though policy measures do work if they, if they are implemented. But clearly, we need a, a, a very large scaling up of, of actions to, to, to get the changes that are needed to reverse um, biodiversity loss. I'm aware that we're running a little bit of short of time, so um, I'll leave it there um, and hand back to you, uh, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this was very comprehensive um, and we have a lot of questions coming in from the audience. And so we have about 15 minutes, David, to go through those. Um, Hopefully we can get through most of them. Uh, but the first question I wanted to ask was, so this report was launched in September. And so that's now it's over a month ago that, that it was launched. Um, so is the UNCBD, are you all seeing any renewed commitments since the report was launched? Is there anything that you can share with the audience on, if there's been some positives from this maybe overall kind of dire report? So thank you very much. I mean, we certainly, um, we think that this report and other reports that, that have come out at, at around the same time um, have under, you know, have highlighted that, that efforts really will need to be, to, to be stepped up. I think there's um, a general 
um, certainly a, a disappointment that the progress was so limited towards the current uh, Aichi targets. Um, I think there is increased awareness of, of, of the importance of this issue. We were very pleased to see at the UN uh, summit, for instance, um, over 100 heads of state and government uh, highlight the importance of this issue uh, and um, call for uh, a more ambitious post-2020 global biodiversity framework. I think more generally the, the situation that the world finds itself in now uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, it's, it's clear to, to people at large that something is wrong in the relationship between people and nature uh, and that actions will need to be stepped up. We have a massive opportunity, I think, um, in terms of looking at how countries, how governments plan their recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, what sorts of economic pathways will be followed, what sort of economic stimulus uh, approaches will be put in place. We've heard a lot of uh, very positive ideas and commitments in this regard, um, but at the same time, unfortunately, when we look at um, uh, many of those, many of the um, recovery plans that are being put in place, we do still find, unfortunately, greater attention on, um, on approaches that can, will unfortunately continue business as usual and um, relatively little concrete evidence so far of investment in, in, in green recovery. So I think, we, we, yes, we see more awareness. Yes, we see more um, statements of good intent um, but we need to see this followed up by concrete um, policies in place to, um, to change those underlying drivers of, of, of biodiversity loss, <clears throat> which are often also the same drivers of, as, of, of climate change, the same drivers that increase the risk of, of, of future pandemics. So you, you had said earlier in the presentation that um, unless we stop climate change, and forgive me if, I, if I'm <laughs> um, botching these words a bit, but unless we stop climate change, we won't be able to curb biodiversity loss. And so climate change is definitely a part of the pu public discourse. Do you think that biodiversity loss is a part of this public discourse, is something everyday people are discussing and talking about like climate change? And yeah, what do you think about that? Like, if, and and if, if, if climate change is something that we, if we have to stop that first, should we still be looking at biodiversity loss or should we put our full force behind climate change? So I think most people probably do not divide this, this problem in uh, as perhaps sometimes, you know, we do uh, into separate into in, in, into separate uh, aspects. This is all part of the same problem. Uh, clearly, we cannot address um, biodiversity loss without addressing climate change. We also probably cannot address climate change without protecting biodiversity and restoring uh, uh, ecosystems as well. So these are really two sides of the same coin. Um, as I mentioned, um, so-called nature-based solutions, so investing in, 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 in preventing the loss of, of further forests, which would, would emit more uh, greenhouse gases, but also in restoring forests and other, other ecosystems, we can reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We can contribute yeah. to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This has to be alongside actions to phase out fossil fuels. Um, if we don't address climate change, however, those very same ecosystems themselves, the resilience of them will be weakened and they could themselves become carbon sources. So this 
you know, we, we have to invest in action on climate change and biodiversity together in order to, to have a, a virtuous cycle wh whereby ecosystems can play a larger part in solving the climate problem uh, as, as well. Yeah. Well, I think that this is kind of a perfect segue for this next question. Um, this is coming from Julie from Canada. And so what would you say the biggest challenge is to meeting forestry targets right now, just since you touched upon that just a, a moment ago? So um, probably the biggest challenge to looking at forest targets is actually also looking at how we manage agriculture and the whole entire um, food system. Um, because obviously there is a limited amount of land. We need land for, um, for, for biodiversity. We need land for food production. We can also manage those agricultural lands in ways that um, um, can protect biodiversity and help biodiversity also contribute to food production as, as well. Um, but if you look at um, the evidence from those countries that have um, um, managed to reduce forest loss and in fact um, res restore their, their forest area, they have also invested in, in agriculture and invested in the capacity of, of farmers to increase their, their yields in a, in a sustainable way. Um, so, yeah, these these aspects are very, very much uh, in, interlinked. Great. OK, thank you. And we have um, two questions that are sort of related. Um, so the first one is from Nikul. Um, and Nikul says, um, it seems like we've been missing targets um, over and over again. <laughs> um, shall we make more? Um, should we, should we continue to make ambitious targets or should we be more realistic with our target setting? And then the next one is that the GBO5 report referred to the need for well-designed goals and targets um, with clear language and quantitative elements and has that been missing up until this point? So just two, one on, should we continue to be so ambitious and then have well-designed goals and targets? Has that been missing up to this point with clear language and quantitative elements? So, as time has elapsed and as we, as we have failed to, um, to reduce the, the, the rate of biodiversity loss and, 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 uh, and, and restore biodiversity, the need for ambition is even increased, right? Because we have to make up lost time, essentially. So, we certainly need um, goals and targets that are that are ambitious. Uh, obviously they have to be realistic, but um, if we're looking at how important biodiversity is, if we, if we recognize that without protecting biodiversity, we'll not be able to achieve our other sustainable development goals, we'll not be able to have sustained development, then it becomes an imperative. We need, we need, um, ambitious goals. But clearly, um, ambitious goals alone are not enough. So what is missing? I think what has been missing in the past is um, the absence really of a, of a whole of government approach. Um, it's perhaps been something that has been left to environment, environment ministries to, to address. Um, we have had important investments in, in conservation actions, but they're not enough because they are overwhelmed by, um, by other factors, by, by, by broader um, underlying drivers coming from the economy at, at large. And as I pointed out, we've really failed to um, put in place the, the incentive structures, the incentive mechanisms that are needed. We are still spending much more on um, destroying nature than on protecting it. So clearly we need, um, you know, a whole of government ap approach. We need heads of state and government to take this as, they, as a central priority for their, for their actions. 
And so in the new framework, it will be important also that we have a very strong monitoring and review mechanism uh, in order to make sure that countries stay on track or um, they make commitments that are commensurate with those global targets and then stay on track. Thank you. And I think that you just brought up a very good point that it's often left to um, the environmental ministries to, to deal with these types of issues like biodiversity loss, uh, climate change, climate crisis. Um, and so now, especially 2020, we're seeing we have about two minutes left until we have to finish the session. But with 2020, we're seeing, um, you know, COVID-19, <laughs> everyone's seeing that. And we're starting to seeing this merge of environment, health, like everyone having to work together at all levels of, of government of all different sectors. And so would you say that this coronavirus pandemic, would you say that it could tell us a bit about the state of the world's biodiversity? And would you say that this is a concrete example for us on what biodiversity loss looks like? Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Clearly um, the the destruction of, of, uh, of biodiversity in the sense of um, encroachment into natural areas, uh, into reducing the, the diversity and complexity of, of, the, of the wildlife communities in those areas, um, increases the risk of um, the emergence of zoonotic diseases that which can become pandemic. Um, of course, the factors in any one case are, are, are quite complex, but there's no doubt that um, the drivers of biodiversity loss are also uh, the drivers of increased risk um, of, of pandemic yeah. emergence. And so investing in biodiversity protection and restoration uh, and in the sustainable and safe use of wildlife, not only will it, it reduce um, biodiversity loss, reduce the risk of, uh, of extinction, it will also reduce the risk of um, disease emergence. And we'll see um, the launch of another um, significant report tomorrow, um, um, which will provide more evidence in, 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 in this area. Um, that's the IPBES report. The IPBES workshop report on biodiversity. I can share that as well in the chat for everyone, but unfortunately that's all the time we have for today. Um, but David, I wanna thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come speak at the GLF Biodiversity Digital Conference. Um, I will share more resources with everyone in the chat. And yes, thanks so much, David. Thank you very much, Melissa. And thank you to the whole GLF team for this opportunity. Thank you.